The final episodes of The Witcher Season 3 are upon us, and I say upon us like I'm talking about something horrific descending upon the people of the world because, well, let's just get to that, no intro is really needed. If you watched these final episodes, that means you've become an unfortunate witness to a masterclass in missed potential, the likes of which we're unlikely to ever see again. Part 2 of Season 3 opens with what should have been the best two-episode stretch of the entire series, the coup on Thanet Isle that, in a perfect world, would have been very carefully set up over the course of the last season and a half, which obviously didn't happen, so instead what we have here is maybe the show's greatest achievement in terms of taking something that could have been an all-time great episode of television and turning it into a mediocre mess. And I'm not just throwing that out there as a bold statement, let me explain why and what they've done here. First though, since we're on the topic of experiences that maybe would put you in the mood to sue somebody, I do want to take a few seconds to thank the sponsor of today's video, Morgan and Morgan, who of course, you guys know this, are America's largest injury law firm. This is still not a joke, it's actually the second time they've sponsored a video of mine, they must be Witcher fans over there, but we'll be hearing more from them a little later. Now, I said two episodes, but that was the perfect world version, we don't live there, so instead the entire coup and the immediate fallout of it is forced down into by far the shortest episode of the entire season, an episode that also has a lot of other things eating up screen time. The episode starts out by showing us that Philippa, Dijkstra, and a few others have rounded up and shackled almost every single mage on Thaned with the help of Redanian soldiers. Now, the show does a very poor job of explaining what is happening here, because I don't think the show itself really knows. All you're given as a viewer is the word traitor over and over again. They're traitors, says Philippa. Vilgefortz is working with Nilfgaard and has been creating portals for Emir. So why are there like 20 shackled mages then? Well, just because is the reason the show gives you. Dijkstra says they're all shackled as a precaution, because while some are Vilgefortz's allies, the rest just need to hear them out. So imprisonment to all neutral parties, I guess. I should point out, this entire scenario with captured mages is another case where the writers have taken what the original story did and just made it way worse with their changes. In the book, only a very small number of mages that could be counted on one hand are captured, and all the neutral parties are invited to attend their trial. Makes a lot more sense than in the show where there's 20 shackled. This whole situation and their changes to it also make Dijkstra look like a moron. Instead of the plan being to capture known or heavily suspected enemies from carefully gathered intel, which is kinda his entire thing, the plan is instead to just arrest everyone. 75% of the people they capture are neutral parties who are shackled in what is essentially poison to them, Dimeridium. Yeah, really a smart plan to make enemies out of 15 of the most powerful mages on the continent, just because. After Taseya shows up though, Vilgefortz gets slapped, and because the show made Vilgefortz and Taseya lovers, this makes her very angry, and she frees everyone, which leads to a breakout of violence. Then we get another Dijkstra is an idiot moment, because what I want in a Witcher show are moments where Dijkstra looks like an idiot, but for no apparent reason Dijkstra decides he needs to provoke Geralt, and tells him, if you're looking for Ciri, I assure you Witcher, it's already too late, because of course Radovid had been sent to capture her, though Dijkstra doesn't know that failed yet. Anyway, Dijkstra says this as he's walking away, like Geralt's just gonna go, Oh, okay, I don't care what you mean by that. <laughs> if Dijkstra hadn't said anything, Geralt would have just taken off to find Ciri, but of course, I guess this Dijkstra just doesn't know when to keep his mouth shut. This all leads to Dijkstra having another idiotic moment where he tries to fight Geralt 1v1. Sure, after he's overpowered, he says, can't blame a man for trying, but I disagree. I think you can blame a man for trying, especially when it's Dijkstra we're talking about, a character that is only involved in the story because of his mind. In the books, he is smarter than everyone. That's the entire justification for his character. It's why a regular guy is playing politics with mages and kings. He's incredibly clever and 10 steps ahead of everyone at almost every turn, so he's worth keeping around. It's like the only thing whoever wrote this episode knew about Dijkstra was what he does at the end of Reasons of State, and they just wrote his entire character around that. They do say it's hard to write a character smarter than you are, and I would say that really checks out with Netflix Witcher. Now, while I'd like to immediately move on and get to what they've done with Yen, Siri, and Ryans, the centerpiece of this episode that I have to cover is the Battle at Aratuza, which 
I unfortunately can't say many positive things about. Vilgefortz reveals to Desea that he's letting in Scoia'tael forces and a few Nilfgaardian soldiers. And then they do this Avengers shot with all of the hero mages, which I honestly just thought was hilarious. I mean, 90% of the characters that show up don't have names, or if they do, it's only in the credits, and 95% of them no one cares about at all. I say 95% and not 100 because at least Taseya is there, and Miana Burring is amazing in this show. Now, I know I'll get a lot of pushback on this because I've seen quite a bit of praise for it, but I thought this one room battle was awful for the most part. It spread across the entire episode, but I'll just get it all out of the way now. My issue with it has nothing to do with any changes. I mean, there's not a lot of information on this fight to begin with. Geralt isn't there in the books, so we don't see it. We're following him, not anyone else. All you really hear later is that Scoia'tael show up, get wiped out quickly because they're just homeless elves, and the rest of the fighting is between the Nilfgaard-aligned mages and the northern mages, with the neutral parties attempting to minimize the damage. For whatever reason though, the show decided to turn it into a one-sided bloodbath where the Scoia'tael walk all over everyone else. It makes absolutely no sense the mages get their asses handed to them on a dimeridium platter, and they also seem to frequently forget that they can even use magic. For about half of the fight, you just have them punching the elves, or Kira kicking them, or Margarita wrestling with a fully armored soldier. And when they do remember to use magic, it's always just a small orb directed at one target. This show just can't ever seem to pick a lane or be consistent to the most basic things they've already established. They've shown time and time again what magic is capable of, and arguably more important, how ineffective the Scoia'tael are. Yet we get episode 6. Listen, if you love fights where there are extremely dramatic death or near-death scenes accompanied by swelling emotional music for characters you have no attachment to and may not even know the name of, then this episode will be for you, because there are like five of those. This battle has no stakes, zero characters you have any attachment to die, and then the battle ends with two major moments that I guess were meant to prove that every mage other than Stregobor and Tesea are completely incompetent. Tesea turns into Emperor Palpatine with a lightning spell, and then Stregobor just shows up out of nowhere and puts a final end to most of the remaining elves using the power of racism, I guess. Please tell me I'm not the only person who thought this. Let me lay out the situation. So, Yennefer protects Triss, Sabrina, and I think that's supposed to be Marty from Francesca and some other elves. And then Stregobor just shows up out of nowhere to fight the elves. I guess he escaped prison. And the first thing he says is, You filthy, disgusting mongrels. I have been waiting for this moment for a very long time. And you can just see the saliva water falling out of the corners of his mouth. He's clearly relishing the opportunity to kill some elves, and this is a character they've shown several times to be very prejudiced against them. He's even horrible to Yennefer earlier in the season because of her elven blood. Let's just say this was a really interesting moment to give to Stregobor, the good guys escape because of it, and he even uses his hatred to tap into fire magic. I don't know, the triumphant music that was swelling during this scene was giving me mixed signals. Francesca does show up later with no explanation though, even though Stregobor faced off against her, so I assume she escaped, or maybe Stregobor lost, I don't know, it's not said at any point, but whatever, let's finally get to what they've done with our main characters. It took me this long to get to it because, well, Geralt and Ciri are barely in episode 6. Ciri runs off when Radovid's attempt at capturing her fails. If you remember, Yaskir was supposed to be looking out for her, but got distracted when Radovid showed up and gave him some Redanian intelligence in the nearby garden shed. Ciri taking off leads to a reunion with Yennefer somewhere outside of Thaned, at which point Ryans just happens to find them two seconds later. Ciri fights him for an additional two seconds, and then Geralt also just happens to appear at this random area in the countryside at that exact moment, and kills him. I guess it looked cool, but other than that, poor Ryans in this show, what a joke, honestly. Most people don't care about Ryans because he's not in Witcher 3, but I'm telling you this should be an Eskel turned into a tree level complaint. I mean, for me, it's worse than that. Ryans is supposed to be such a fun and persistent villain, and arguably the best scene in the entire series is centered around him and Ciri near the very end of the story, yet the show made him completely useless and killed him off multiple seasons early. It's truly a shame, and what bothers me more is that if they wanted a semi-important death in this episode, then there were so many opportunities for it with characters that have outlasted their purpose. 
I mean, this cast is so unbelievably bloated because they wanted to make everyone a main character. So why not kill off Istrid? He's been useless for two entire seasons. Or Stregobor, as far as I can tell, he's still alive and probably coming back. Anyway, directly after Reince's death and three seconds after the trio's reunion, Yen decides she's gotta go back. The sorceresses need her. So she runs all the way back to Aratuza. Runs, I guess she can't teleport anymore. And that is what leads to the Stregobor saving the day moment I mentioned earlier. When we eventually cut back to Geralt and Ciri, they're in another location on Thanet Isle, and then Kahir just appears. At which point Ciri takes an entire minute to just blurt out their full history for the sake of the audience, because 99.9% .9 of viewers aren't going to remember what their connection even is. And when Ciri is finished, Geralt just stands back at a distance and lets her fight a fully trained Nilfgaardian soldier by herself. Kahir ends up not being interested in fighting though, as he eventually throws down his sword and word vomits out that he renounces all of his actions from the past two and a half seasons. He's very sorry and just wants Ciri to kill him immediately. Now I hereby, and I can't believe I just used the word hereby, but I hereby make the claim that this is the perfect Netflix Witcher scene. Perfect in the sense that it is everything wrong with this show masterfully squeezed into about 90 seconds. They have spent three entire seasons completely assassinating the character of Kahir. The entire point of Kahir is that he's just a soldier, one that wore an intimidating helmet when Ciri first saw him, so she has nightmares thinking he's this horrible monster before facing him at Thaned, at which point she realizes, oh, he's just a young boy under that helmet. The show, though, decided to make Kahir a guy who just murders innocent people constantly and enjoys it, at least up until season three, when he makes a sad face after killing one of his supposed best friends, so you know he feels kinda bad about it. However, the Netflix writers must have finally realized that his story can't move forward with how they've set him up, so they have this scene where he may as well have looked straight into the camera to say, oh, everything I've done up until this point, forget about it, it doesn't matter anymore, let's just move on. Which of course begs the question, what was the point of changing his entire journey then? Of course, there isn't one, there was no plan, this whole season is backtracking over their constant mistakes, and like everything, the result is that this character is a joke compared to what they already had to work with. The actor is good though, I mean that, and what a waste. Anyway, then Skoyatel also show up to the field, so Kahir runs off to fight them and buy Siri time. And I was watching that scene thinking, what exactly is he going to do? He's one guy on foot versus five Skoyatel on horseback, and they've just shown us that the most powerful mages on the continent are no match for homeless elves, so uh, what's his plan? Don't worry about it is the answer, we don't get to see what happens, we just hear later that those Skoyatel never returned, so I guess Kahir wiped all of them out. Also looking at that scene again, if the Skoyatel wanted Siri, which they did, couldn't they have just gone around Kahir? They are in an open field, after all. Anyway, the Vilgaforts vs. Geralt fight is up next, the fight that sets the course for the rest of Geralt's story, and if it seems like I'm jumping around, I'm really not, that's just how this episode is. Ciri and Geralt run from Kahir, and then Vilgaforts just pops up and Ciri goes away. Now the fight itself is very, very good. Watching it back, there's amazing stunt work going on from both sides, and as far as TV show fights go, it was done well. It's beyond obvious that both actors put in some serious legwork to make this fight happen the way it came out. You like my stuff. Let's get to the seventh episode, The Desert One, aka the worst rated episode of Netflix Witcher ever, and it's not even close. It's down to a 4.1 on IMDb. Episode six ends with Geralt losing to Vilgaforts and getting transported to Broccolon with the help of Triss, whereas Ciri gets randomly teleported to the Karath Desert. And that all checks out with what's supposed to happen, but Yennefer ends up hanging out with the remaining sorceresses back at Aratuza, which is a new show-only direction for her. Episode 7, though, only follows up on Ciri, for the most part at least. We do see Geralt and Broccolon for a minute with Milva, which I'll talk about Milva, don't worry. But as far as Episode 7 goes, that's about it for non-Ciri content until the very end. The rest is all about her escaping the desert for about 40 straight minutes. Now, to be fair to the show, I'm pretty sure that this always would have been a controversial episode, even in a much better Witcher show. Not necessarily a 4 out of 10, but I don't think it ever would have been a fan favorite unless Ciri had become a breakout show character people loved more than Geralt. 
The story of episode 7 is what happens in the books. For better or worse, you get a full, pretty long chapter where Ciri is just wandering the desert, going in circles, and hallucinating. Really, the main thing the show changes is that they have Ciri swear every three seconds, and also they throw in some pretty forgettable action. Now, that's not to say I loved this episode just because it was book accurate, I also found it very slow, but really, what this is more than an adaptation is the tryout as to whether or not you think Freya Allen can carry the show moving forward, and I do think I know what the answer will be from most. You know, personally, I think Freya is a fine actress, she's trying her best, and she does especially shine when she's on screen with Geralt. However, at the same time, I do think that where Ciri's story is right now and where it's about to go is and will be robbed of most of its impact because of how much they've aged Ciri up. Keep in mind, Ciri is supposed to be barely 13 at this point in the story, and where the show would end if it makes it that far, she'd be 15 or maybe 16 depending on who you're arguing with. In the Netflix show, I don't know how old she's supposed to be, but I see a 20-something adult playing out the beginning of a storyline that's meant to be a death of innocence tale for a kid. By the time season 4 films, if it happens, we're talking about a 23-year-old Siri, and that's just season 4. Also, for those of you who might be about to comment about a couple of specific scenes in the books that might be too much for TV, you can 100% tell Siri's story without those, and they're not going to happen in the show anyway, so it's not even worth talking about. This version of Siri can handle herself way too well. That's the other thing, they frequently had show Siri single-handedly wiping out monsters with no effort, and fighting multiple full-grown men like they're nothing at all. And keep in mind, those are all show decisions. This part of the story is where Siri should have, like, no experience, and it's where you should be thinking, oh no, Siri is not ready for this, she shouldn't be on her own, she's just a kid. And that's where 95% of the tension and interest comes from. This Siri, though, it's not really like that. Geralt and Yennefer are the worst protectors of all time in the show. They just stand back and let Siri do the fighting, so most of that stress of her being on her own is completely gone. What's more is that her journey starting now is Siri fighting to get back to Geralt and Yennefer, but in the show, the Geralt she'll be fighting to reunite with will be one she's never met, and the Yennefer she's trying to reconnect with will be one that just tried to sacrifice her to a demon, so that connection is also pretty weak and thin compared to how it should be. My point is, if those who continue watching don't like Siri's story moving forward, I wouldn't point the finger at Freya Allen. I think they've put her in a near impossible spot and have kneecapped a lot of the potential that should have been there for Ciri's time on her own. Her story ends this season with an escape from the desert and a connection with the rats, who we'll talk about when the spin-off comes out, because yep, they're making a spin-off about the rats, in fact, it already filmed. The things I do for this channel. Now not Geralt, but Yennefer gets the majority of the attention in the final episode, although Geralt does get some screen time in this little show that's called The Witcher, at least that was the title the last time I checked. Both Yennefer and Geralt think that Ciri is going to Nilfgaard, that is announced all across the land and they assume she was captured. Of course, that ends up not being the case, Nilfgaard has the fake Ciri, not the real one, but they don't know that, and the show just leaves non-book readers in the dark until the reveal at the end. My big question during the final episode, which, like I said, mostly focused on Yennefer, was whether or not Tissaia was going to get her book death, where she uses her letter opener for an alternative purpose. And in the end, they do actually go through with it. I am genuinely sad to see Miana Burring go. She was the best actress this show had, I don't even think it's close, and her character's death leads to Yennefer forming the Lodge of Sorceresses. Yes, Yennefer forms the Lodge in the show. Whereas the Yen of the books was basically the only sorceress not in the Lodge, this Yennefer forms it. They've taken away Philippa's defining moment and given it to Yennefer, which, let's be honest, isn't really a surprise. They're clearly taking Yennefer in a show-only direction for a while, because otherwise, she wouldn't even be in Season 4. I should point out, they didn't forget about Philippa, instead they have her orchestrate the death of Vizimir and place Radovid on the throne as her and Dijkstra's puppet which is a twist on what's supposed to happen because they made Radovid 40 instead of 12. I still like the actress for Philippa a lot, I personally think Philippa is the hardest character to nail the energy of, and she's doing a great job. I will say, I am pretty sure that they're going to have Philippa take over the lodge eventually. I mean, they have to, right? Maybe she'll get Yennefer ousted somehow, because otherwise I just don't know what the point of the lodge would even be long term. 
It feels like they just wanted to come up with something for Yennefer to do next season because the books put her on the back burner to say the least, so they delayed what Philippa gets up to and gave it to Yen for the time being. I am just now realizing that I never talked about the setup for Fringilla and Francesca's new adventure, but I don't care, so let's just keep it that way. Geralt's on-screen moments are mostly spent recovering in Brakalon with Yaskier, who makes his way there just as he should. I like how they didn't just completely brush aside Geralt's injuries, those handicaps should stick around next season as well, but the longer the episode went on, the more I was wondering what exactly they're going to do for the switch to Hemsworth. There have been all these writer interviews lately where they keep saying that the switch is going to be lower accurate, meaning they're not just going to recast and move on in the show itself, which in my opinion would be the best option. I think absolutely any attempt at an in-universe explanation for why Geralt suddenly looks like Liam Hemsworth would be stupid, but that's not what they're doing, so my question now is just how stupid they're willing to go, especially since they didn't use Geralt's time recovering in Broccolon for the transition. Here is my pitch for the dumbest possible option. Open season 4 and we only see Cavill Geralt from the back. His injuries are still bothering him, which is putting his search for Ciri at risk. Because of this, Geralt decides that he has no choice but to take the ancient Super Witcher mutations. These were experimental trials tested on by the first ever Witchers on their earliest students, but were eventually locked away after being deemed far too dangerous and unsurvivable for even the strongest subjects. Geralt though thinks the risk is worth taking, and after the process, he looks like Liam Hemsworth for some reason. That's my full-on stupid idea, and it would also give the writers an opportunity to squeeze in another shot at Cavill, which would be on brand, like, here's the new and improved Geralt, this is the better one. Their other options, if we're embracing stupidity with open arms, could involve a multiverse and a Geralt from an alternate dimension. I could totally see them misusing the conjunction all over again, just like they did in Blood Origin. I suppose they could even use Nimue, the Lady of the Lake, as a future framing device. I don't want to say more because that would be spoiler territory, but that's an option too I just wanted to throw on the table. Now the last point I want to touch upon is Netflix's version of Milva. Like I've been saying, you can't leave unless you get better. And you won't get better unless you let us help you. The waters weren't successful. Go back to bed, Witcher. No, Witcher. No news of Nilfgaard or the girl. The waters are supposed to make you forget. Guess they didn't work on me either. Listen, I don't talk very often about the casting, mostly because for me, it's just not near the top on the list of issues I have with this show. In my opinion, you could take the Netflix cast, and if you handed it off to a passionate showrunner and a talented team of writers who love this world, you could end up with a good Witcher show. Would it be perfect or exactly what I would have had in mind? No, and don't get me wrong, there are some miscasts that are just too far off, but there's also a lot of wasted talent on display. We are not seeing the best of these actors because the writing is so lowbrow. I mean, the executive producer of Netflix Witcher said in an interview this week that they specifically write this show for people with severe TikTok brain rot. And I'm not making a joke, that's something that was just said a few days ago as of recording this. Sure, you could say that's just an attempt at an excuse for how badly the show is being received lately, but either way, it's a terrible look. That said, I have to make an exception when it comes to talking about casting to talk about the acting for Milva. I don't know if it was the direction, the actress, or the script. I don't really care what the reason was, because ultimately what actually matters is that the performance that ended up in the final cut was awful. It was stiff, awkward, and it just felt like the actress was reading all of her lines for the very first time. The big issue with that comes down to the fact that Milva is easily the single most important casting choice since season one. This isn't a parody Batman elf situation like I talked about in my part one review, where we were seeing a rough performance, but at least it was for a character named Gallatin that Netflix invented just to kill off after half a dozen scenes. No, Milva will be on screen a lot moving forward. She's incredibly important. In fact, if they hadn't invented a storyline for Yennefer, then Milva would easily be a more important character than her for quite some time. Season 4 doesn't start filming until next year, so hopefully that's enough time to see a major improvement, especially if I'm going to keep powering through this show just so I can review it for the channel. Well, that is all I've got for you today, although I suppose I should give this part a rating since I did for part 1. I gave the first half a 5 out of 10, or the first 5 episodes, 
and part two gets a three. I feel like I've taken a bullet in making this review and if you enjoyed the video, consider leaving a like and subscribing. And also, by the way, my next upload will be a huge one I've been putting together on Kingdom Come Deliverance. And after that, if I have time before the Cyberpunk expansion, I will be doing a What Would Geralt Do video for Hearts of Stone. I just can't wait to talk about things I enjoy again, and I'm very thankful that I don't have to talk about this show for a very long time. Thank you to my patrons for supporting the channel as always, I'll have a couple of cool bonus videos going up later this month, and thanks again to Morgan and Morgan for sponsoring this video. If you didn't hear earlier, Morgan and Morgan are America's largest injury law firm, and the coolest thing about them is that they charge you absolutely nothing for their expertise unless they win your case. There are no sign-up fees or upfront costs, and if you're ever injured in an accident, filing a claim can be done in just eight clicks at www.forthepeople.com slash neon night or by calling pound law that's pound 529 from your cell phone and if you become a client of morgan and morgan they will fight to get you the best possible results anyway thanks again for watching and i will see you in the next one